Welcome to this episode of On Finding Peace, brought to you by Life's Journey Life Coaching. Our host, Chris Shea, is a counselor, nationally recognized speaker, and author on topics of guiding us to finding peace in our daily lives. Learn more about Chris Shea by visiting his website, www.lifesjourneyblog.com. Well, welcome everyone to another episode of On Finding Peace. I'm your host, Chris Shea, and this is the podcast where we talk about practical tips that we all can do on a daily basis, which can lead us to finding our inner peace. I know that inner peace is possible. I've been without it. I've found ways to get it. And on this podcast, we talk about ways that we can find it and keep today, it on a daily Lori basis. Kasser, who is working on health and nutrition and how that leads us into finding our own peace as we work through, uh, you know, our health and our wellness challenges. And I know finding peace is the focus of this. And I think that uh, Lori is the first guest we have had thus far to talk about the nutrition side Mm -hmm. of what it takes to uh, have us find our peace. So thank you for joining us, Lori. You're welcome, Chris. It's great to be here. Well, it's our pleasure. Uh, Can you uh, tell us a bit about yourself and, you know, how did you get involved in being a health coach? Sure. Well, it's, um, it's been about a 25 year career and it sort of started as part time, more of a hobby and really uh, primarily to get my own health and particularly my weight under control. So I had a lot of, um, I was an athlete um, Mm. back in the day. And so keeping my weight under control seemed to be, you know, an easier quest coupled Mm -hmm. with the fact that I was, I was younger and my eating habits weren't that great, but I was exercising regularly as a result of, you know, being in the gym. I was a soccer player. So um, Uh, 90 minutes of intense uh, full on activity has a way of really kind of keeping that energy under control. And um, that as time passed, I hung up my boots and life changed and, you know, went to on to get married. And I was in the restaurant business at the time. And of course, being in the restaurant business gives you full access to lots of yummy food and <laughs> I'm a manager of a restaurant. So I had to taste the food and, and, uh, and I was I was cons- a drinker at the time as well. I enjoyed wine and, and uh, having cocktails at the end of a busy shift. So, you know, all of those things, over time started to sort of catch up with me. And um, I saw the weight start to kind of very slowly creep on over the course of my 20s until I got into my early 30s and realized that it was really kind of out of control. I started the whole dieting cycle and, Mm -hmm. um, you know, went through kind of, I think, every iteration of diet that existed. And it was just, you know, this good, the same old thing, you know, you lose a few pounds and gain a few more back. And it was just that vicious cycle that, uh, that wreaks havoc, not only on your body, but on your psyche as well. So I, uh, I got into studying nutrition, um, actually, as an experience I had with the nutritionist myself. And after having been on my own diets, I, I went out and saw a the help of a nutritionist and was really quite fascinated with um, getting a kind of a different education on food and the effects of food on your body and realizing that maybe this is what I needed to understand a little bit more about. So I started to study it Mm -hmm. and that took a real interest. It was sort of like, wow, this is actually what I really feel called to do. It came very naturally to me. I really embraced the science of it. Um, I was, it was the kind of thing where you, you would, you know, I wake up in the morning and, and I would be thinking about it. I was in a different, uh, on a different career track at the time, but I was um, really, you know, every kind of spare moment I had, I was studying and uh, uh, I went out and did a, a three year um, diploma in holistic nutrition and health coaching. And uh, I started just, you know, kind of taking clients on, 
more, you know, sort of in a friend, friends and family kind of way initially. And uh, as I really started to get comfortable and confident with it, I started to really see uh, a road through that this could actually become a new career path for me. So that's kind of how I started out. It was really just a result of my own struggles and my desire to get that sorted out and then really, you know, also to see how I could help out um, people, the people around me. So that's kind of how, right. how, how it began. Uh, that's a, it's a wonderful path because it was something that seems to be very important to you and something that came from you versus coming you know, from others or from the outside. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Definitely. Uh, very close ties to it. And it really has continued to be that in that it's really been a parallel to my own sort of life journey and the growth, the continual growth and transformation. And um, as I think, you know, you well know, as your path is not a destination, it's just kind <laughs> of a an ongoing journey where we continually peel away the layers of the proverbial onion. And, uh, and my food, my relationship with food has been a, a quite a, an interesting reflection of that journey. So it's, um, it, it's, it's been a love that is, it doesn't seem to be leaving anytime soon. Right. Exa- <laughs> exactly. And, you know, I think for many people, your journey isn't that out of the norm in, in that, you know, in, in our younger years when we are more energetic and, and actually doing things that, you know, we seem to be healthy and then that fades over time. So I wonder when we look at that, you know, how do we get some of that motivation that, that says, well, maybe we need to make a change? Because, mm-hmm. you know, a, a lot of people that I speak with, you know, just kind of put it as, well, that's normal, you know, mm-hmm. As you age, you get a little extra on you, you know, as you age, you can do this as, you know, so it's kind of blaming the age and saying, well, that's just part of the aging process. So no big deal. Mm -hmm. Well, I would, uh, you know, just say to anyone there that, that I would absolutely beg to differ um, in that I would say the body that I'm in now is on a physiological and cellular level younger than the one that I was in at the age of 30. And I have continually proven to myself over and over again that age is really just, I mean, I think it's a fact of life. It is, there is an aging process that takes place, but there's so many things that we can do to really create a vitality within and a a quality really a quality of life I think which is what my primary focus is for my health goals right now is how can I create the greatest quality of life you know I don't know that we can completely control what happens in all aspects of our life you know there are genetic elements to health there are Mm -hmm. a lot of environmental elements that are affect our our health but I, I really focus on what are the things that we can control and putting whatever food we put in our mouth is, is a primary choice. Um, our ability to uh, manage stress, I think is another fundamentally important one. And that was one that I really had not explored. I had really focused primarily on the biological nature of food and, and eating. And when I really started to, get under my own, you know, really sort of navigate the internal aspect of my own food landscape. (laughs) It became very obvious to me that we eat for many, many reasons other than true biological hunger. And I think that's really kind of an epidemic. I I can't imagine um, that that I'm sure you must come across that in your work all the time. Oh, definitely. We are such a reactive society and food is such a wonderful element of uh, the ability to feel like we manage our stress a little bit. There's a lot of elements to eating for stress that, um, that I've, that I found, I find a lot in, in my coaching and working with different people that stress is always sort of, it's in there fundamentally, even if you're unconscious of how it's impacting you after a little bit of discovery, it always does come up certainly as a challenge. So um, I, I look at eating really, 
as a way of living. You know, I think that your relationship with food is really a relationship or it's a reflection of the relationship that you have with yourself and the world around you. So I think it's really uh, important that I think the most important distinction I've made probably in the last 10 years, at least, is that rather than exploring the world externally by going to dieting, the world of dieting and looking at, you know, this specific diet or that specific diet, that really the best way that you can serve yourself is to do that inner work, you know, the, to really be able to become self-aware of why you're eating when you're eating. I think that's a much more interesting question than even than what you, what you're eating, what you, you know, what you're eating, of course, is, is going to help create that vitality and that energetic nature that we want to uh, grasp a hold of that we had sort of more organically when we were younger, but it's certainly available to us now through the choices of good food, but as much as good food is, um, it's not just what we're eating, but it's what we're digesting and really what we're thinking about when we're eating, that I think is as important. And, and I like how you're saying that because that kind of brings into my mind some of the things that uh, I read or hear from people is the whole notion of body image. And sometimes it, it seems to turn people off when we talk about dieting or taking care of yourself and they start saying, well, don't buy into the society's skinny image and, you know, don't mm-hmm. buy into that. Are we necessarily saying, you know, that like skinny is in, or are we talking that there there's healthy bodies regardless of, you know, specific shapes. Yeah, so, you know, um, um, what, I think when body we're dealing with, you know, such a, an important factor and determinant in what people um, are eating and certainly how they direct their exercise programs and what they put themselves through. And I know certainly on a personal level as a nutritionist and a health coach, um, I felt an immense pressure, a lot of it self-imposed, but also from society to look a certain way. And, you know, there's an element of congruence where you say, well, you know, am I going to feel confident taking um, advice from a nutritionist that's 50 pounds overweight? So there's lots of different reasons, I guess, that we seek to look a certain way. Society certainly values um, a certain image of thinness. There's no question mm-hmm. about it. We get a lot of messages from the media, you know, the different things that we consume. Um, they're everywhere. And, and I think the success model has a lot to do with, again, living in sort of that materialistic world. Do we have enough of this? Are we, do we have the best job? Are we in the best place? Can we attract the best mate? And I do, you know, I really do feel that it's, um, it's, it's kind of, you really have to question where are you in your particular journey and what is, you know, what is your goal? For, for a while, I really shifted gears and said, just be comfortable in the skin you're in. If you can just accept yourself in whatever body you're in, you know, that's really the greatest place to be. But I, I found, Chris, that it was a bit unrealistic in that there are just some people uh, that really, you know, it, it's about meeting the people halfway and that, yeah, you know, I, I want to have kind of that inner peace, but I also want to look good. I want right. to look, I want to feel, I feel more confident when I'm in a smaller version of myself. So, you know, I have to, it's, it's like, I, as I said, the journey continues to grow in how I approach my work and how I approach it with my own personal journey and how I ap- approach it with others. Um, I think what I found is the less concerned you are with other people's opinions, the more naturally and organically you'll find your way to your natural weight. I don't know if that makes sense. Um, Mm -hmm. But that's really to kind of what I found to be the the truth of it, that there, you know, there does need to be some infrastructure, but it's really kind of personalized depending on the individual, the person that's sitting in front of you and really kind of leaning in and getting to understand and know them and then being able to kind of take them from wherever they are to that kind of next stage of, of, of their life. So. And, and I, I would totally agree. You know, I think it's important that we feel comfortable who we are and, and in the body that we are. But let's say, you know, you're dealing with maybe a relative, friend, whatever, that 
you know, is definitely not healthy, is not taking care of themselves, but is telling everybody, well, I'm really feel good about me and I'm good with all of this. And, you know, don't worry about it because, you know, I'm me, I'm being me. Mm-hmm. Is there an intervention or something that would need to be done in that case? Because, I mean, they are being them, but Mm -hmm. the version of them being them is definitely not a healthy version. Right. Well, you know, it's, again, another great question. It's one of my, one of the things I love to chat with people about. Um, One thing I've really found in the work that I've done is that, that uh, it's very difficult to give unsolicited um, inf- information or advice to, to that's going to fall on deaf ears. If someone is, and even though you can see it as, as a coach and certainly as a counselor, when, when there's denial around someone's, you know, version of, of what constitutes health. And again, that's why I say wherever that person happens to be in their journey, if it was a friend or relative that did not solicit my opinion um, I, I take a very strong position in not counseling unsolicited uh, for, any, for anybody in, in that I think that the greatest um, gift that we can give to someone is to allow them to walk their own path, even if you can clearly see it's not uh, the best path or that you may know something that may help them. Um, what I really find is that if you model the behavior that you wish to see in others, that's the best that you can do. If you create the absolute best version of your own self, but that's the best business card, that's the best advertisement, it's really, you know, the best advice. Mm-hmm. If, if someone is at a place in their life where they're not receiving that information, it's not only going to fall on deaf ears, it's going to create sort of a negative um, a pushback, if you will. And I really try to remain non judgmental about what I think is good health versus what someone else may be. And, you know, I've kind of, my, my, the line in the sand that I draw is if I think someone is, that's really, that is in my inner circle is doing something that is really causing some kind of harm to themselves, then I may, you know, offer some, some assistance. Um, but otherwise, I really believe that the, that there's so many experts out in the in the marketplace now, and I think people are very resistant to having information put to them um, when they haven't asked for it. Somebody shows up and they've really, you know, they're really asking in a genuine way for help. That's you know absolutely. Um, you know, all hands on deck. But otherwise, I always say model the behavior you wish to see in others. That is the absolute, it's kind of, you know, the best revenge, I think, is a life well lived, your own life well lived. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, so giving out the the example, not the unsolicited advice, which which I'm sure is difficult, uh, you know, especially if you see someone Know, who's uh, struggling with their health. But mm-hmm. I, I like that you mentioned that non-judgmentally because, you know, not only do I try to do that in my practice as we work mindfulness, but I also think that that's so important, especially when we're talking about health and nutrition, that, mm-hmm. you know, if we come from that place of assistance and care and concern versus judging a person for, uh, you know, how fit or unfit they may be, you know, in that healthy way is probably going to do wonders. Yeah. Well, and I think that they're not accustomed to that. You know, they, they, uh, they, they've been through, um, I'm, you know, typically before they may come across my um, desk or my internet or wherever we happen to meet up, They've had, they, you know, they've been in a self-deprecating cycle for a long time. And they, you know, you, you just see a lot of talking heads out there saying this is, you know, the way you should be doing it. And I think when that language changes to how can I help you today, because that's really how I look at it from my coaching practice. It's, you know, how can I help you today? And because it's really takes it into the present moment of what is your experience right now and how can I help you today? And that question usually stops people in their tracks a bit because they, 
they come in to the session thinking they need to be prepared and I really just want them to share their experience of what they're feeling right now and when we start asking those kinds of questions rather than asking you know how much do you weigh what are you eating when's the last time you blah 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 I'm not interested in that anymore <laughs> really not right I'm really interested in how are you feeling and, you know, particularly I work with a lot of men, which is, um, you know, it's not, I didn't really set out to attract men, women, or anybody specifically. It just kind of happened in a natural way. And I really enjoy working with men because I found that they have really shut down the feeling aspect um, because it's been devalued so much in our society and it hasn't been cultivated uh, in our younger that when, when boys are boys before they become men, it's something I think is, is an area that is um, really ripe for discussion. And when I start having conversations with men about how they feel, they generally need a little work before they can actually tap in right. and tell me what the answer to those questions are. So I think that that's something that I'm more interested in is, you know, how are you feeling? What's happening? And how can I help you today? Um, rather than, uh, you know, we have this much weight to lose and this is what we need to do. And uh, it's just a, a very different conversation. Um, so, and I really find that it's rewarding for both me and for the client. I, I find it interesting that you're working with a lot of men. And, mm -hmm. and maybe that's just my own, uh, you know, stereotype of, of the nutrition and the health field in, in that sense. But I, I would have thought it'd be a lot more women than men. Mm -hmm. And I do work with, I do work with women as well. Um, but I, but I see, I would say that the, the, the larger percentage of, of people that I work with are men. And I think that it comes from the environment that I, I have, uh, you know, one of my contract jobs is working with a, a, a performance coach who has a large following in the in the U.S. in particular, and that platform attracts a lot of men to it. And I'm the head nutritionist on the wellness program, so I get the that sort of access, one you know, face to face access with the group. And I tend to find that after the fact, people that reach out to me after the peak experience is over with, and they're now trying to kind of figure out how to hold on to their health on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. um, again, it's, it's men that are reaching out. And I think it is, a, it is kind of in the, in the way that I approach conversations we have when we're at these wellness programs by kind of, you know, incorporating both the, the physiological, I have a very strong science background, so I can speak about the effects of food on the brain, the effects of the supplements on the brain and how that, impacts our ability to you know have the edge whether it be in business or in relationships and then also you know i always do gravitate towards the feeling aspect of it and ask questions that are maybe of a more personal nature um, and i think that i i create an environment that is safe for men to talk right. about this kind of stuff without feeling like i'm judging them or you know that that um that it's anything more than two people having a really, you know, profound conversation. And, and I'm sure that makes a huge difference, you know, that for, I mean, myself and speaking for men I've dealt with, you know, that is the big thing is you don't want to be judged, especially if you're going to the gym or, you know, trying to, you know, lose that belly that's happening as we're getting older. And, you know, so, going into that type of atmosphere where we're not being judged for any of that would probably make a huge difference and, and have, you know, the men coming back. Yeah, I think it, I think it is. And I think that it's also, you know, it's the ability to have to ask these questions and really, you know, it's just changing the nature of what they're, they've been accustomed to. And, it opens up areas in their life where they start to see that some of the their eating behaviors and things of reasons that they are that they are eating have less to do with food or hunger and more to do with in you know, really filling a void that exists in their life that they didn't realize that they had 
And that's when I think you really open the opportunity for a different kind of um, change, if you will. Yeah, and, and that kind of brings me into what I was impressed with your site and one of the reasons that we're talking is because you're making this connection, which you had really just uh, uh, intimated that, you know, when you work on the wellness and, and the nutrition side, you tend to become more at peace and happier about yourself. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, how, how do we find that connection? Well, you know, I think that one of the most important things is that we, that you, you have to cert- first of all, have an awareness of the world that we live in to begin with and really start to appreciate and understand that a lot of people and the numbers are kind of staggering the, the epidemic of obesity. And, you know, you go from just the numbers of people that are generally overweight and then you get to obesity and, you know, and, and, the, and, the, and the, the age is, the, the demographics getting younger and younger. And it, it really is a reflection of the food world that we live in and the fact that we have such a large uh, proportion of the food that we're exposed to is unhealthy and it's the least expensive food. It's the most accessible Mm -hmm. food and it's the most convenient for us to acquire. So the numbers, you know, it's a, it's being able to step back and say, wow, you know, we're, we're eating this food that's unhealthy and what is it that drives us to eat it? And I think that, you know, there's lots of different reasons. One of the most is that we, are living in a world that's, there's a lot of dysfunction. There's a lot of chaos and a lot of tension. It's a very fast paced, um, linear goal driven uh, society. And it's as human beings, I think our human nature has been a little bit uh, overlooked and a little bit exploited. And Mm -hmm. what I think happens is our reward system kind of gets uh, out of whack and we start using food for comfort and pleasure versus nourishment. And some people, until we actually open that discussion and start to look at the Western diet and, you know, eating like literally food is available on every street corner. um, When you start to really kind of dissect your own eating behavior, uh, you start to realize that you really have little knowledge of what it is that you're doing. And because so much of it is habitual and unconscious. And one of the first inquiries that I ask people to make is just to simply start, begin to notice their food environment. Every time that you go to reach for food, you have an opportunity to really kind of explore the environment that you're living in. And, you know, what are your, what are some of your food rituals? What's happening around food? And then the second piece is to take the control back it's one of the few things that we genuinely have control over is mm-hmm. the food choices that we make. But in order to do that, you have to really be willing to do the inner work. And, you know, I call it the, it's an inside job. And it's, <laughs> that, it's that journey of self-awareness. And I can guarantee you, I, you know, I know in the work that you do, this is something that's a primary piece of your work is really navigating that interior landscape because the, you know, the most important thing is that you take full ownership of the choices that you're making, that regardless of the messages from society, that you actually have an opportunity to take back the control over what you want your experience of the world to be. So I always say you can be a victim of your circumstance or you can be an architect of your experience. Exactly. And, and, you know, being the architect of your experience really requires you to take a journey that you may not have taken yet. And it starts with, you know, really turning inward and looking at what is going on um, in my own world that's causing me to react. To the, you know, it's like the difference between reacting to the world around us or being responsive. Responsive gives you the chance to be the architect. Um, and so really, I think a lot of my teaching is really, it's very, very simple in, in, in its approach. And it's really uh, what, I, what I help people do, I think, the most is between stimulus and response, there's that greatest opportunity for growth. So really, it's about how do we create a bit of space between a trigger or a cue 
and how we actually respond to it. And in that gap, there's this magnificent opportunity for um, hitting the pause button and kind of stepping back and, you know, becoming kind of a fly on the wall and starting to have a conversation with yourself, which you know, people think initially sounds a little, maybe a little off the wall, but that's the whole beauty of it is that, um, you know, it's what, it's what I use, some people classify as the introduction to sort of a mindful way of uh, encountering life. And, and really bring it back to life on your own terms. But I find that it's hugely impacting. Um, it, it takes some practice for people to really be able to hit that pause button and create a bit of distance between a trigger or, or, or a stimulus or something in their environment that they're about to react to. But I think that, you know, I think that that's where we, you know, where food is concerned, it can be such an automated response that if we don't hit that pause button, we never really get the opportunity to see what is the underlying thing that's driving that reaching for, you know, either overeating, the inability to stop when we are full, uh, reaching for foods that we're craving outside of kind of our normal, you know, what would be normal biological hunger. So I think it, you know, I think that's an area that is, is really been a, and, and it's created tremendous shift in my own life on all facets, not just food related behavior, but I would say on literally every level. And this whole notion of, of having that control is very important for people to understand that, you know, there is very little in life that we can control, but one of those aspects, as you say, is, you know, our, our diet and, and what we do with that and the reasons that we do it. So mm -hmm. I, I think that would become very empowering for someone who is struggling, you know, that the, the struggle isn't out of your control, that the struggle is very much something mm -hmm. that, you know, you can work on and, and actually accomplish it. Right. Well, I think that, the, again, the struggle initially appears to be outside of yourself. And, and, you know, I've had people say to me, I feel like some alien has dropped into my body and completely takes over. I have no control over overeating. I can't simply can't stop myself. So it feels so much like it's outside of yourself. And so we continue to seek external uh, support, you know, by the way of dieting or by someone else's opinion. And it's not about following someone else's diet. It's about understanding your own internal behavior and why you feel driven to allow this alien, <laughs> why you have kind of lost trust in yourself and you've given yourself over. And I think that the really thing that, that's very counterintuitive for people when they first um, may first hear me mention this, I kind of I say to people, you kind of have to lose control in order to gain control. You have to lose control of the control you think you have um, and and sort of surrender, if you will. And that's not language that people that have been kind of hanging on by a thread really can appreciate because right. it really is the sort of more spiritual inner inner language that comes from a place within and and you know it's that first step in saying that i i am willing to navigate that interior landscape and take i, I am willing to appreciate that I, I can take full responsibility full ownership for where i find myself uh, yeah yeah there are some, there's a small percentage of genetic predisposition possibly to a body shape but it's a very small percentage that the majority of the reasons that you find yourself in the place that you're in is a result of the own decisions and choices that you've made. You may have been in an environment that's made it a struggle to make good choices, but the work that I like to do with people is to create the most empowering place that you can come from in any given circumstance. So, you know, does that mean that you are going to be on a hundred percent and make a hundred percent of the best food choices all the time, you know, probably not, but that's life. I, I, right. I think, you know, we have to allow ourselves the opportunity to be real people. And I think that that's where the body image thing also factors back in is that we, we are, you know, we just can't even reconcile looking a certain way. I've asked people, and again, this is an interesting question with men that are overweight and saying, could you, do you think right now you could look at yourself in the mirror 
at the weight that you are right now and find a place of acceptance. And nine times out of 10, Chris, the answer is no. Right. <laughs> I cannot. And that's kind of a starting point because that is an opportunity to say, holy crap, you know, <laughs> I can't. I absolutely cannot say that I could accept myself as I am right now. So, you know, that takes you back to the, the self. It goes right down to the kind of the bare bones of self-worth. And how is it that we fell so far away from, um, from a place of loving ourselves? You know, because I really have come to a place in my life where I see food and feeding ourselves as the absolute number one act of self-care. And self-care is not something that is valued in our society. It's, nope. mis it's mistaken for selfishness. Yeah, and exactly. Course, you know, at every opportunity we're serve others, serve others, serve others, which is a noble quest. But if you are not serving yourself well, you're only serving others as a, a means to look good. <laughs> you're not, right. you know, it doesn't come from a place of genuine humility. And, and so I think, again, having these kinds of conversations really help to open people's eyes to see that, um, you know, there's different things going on that are really driving their behavior, a lot of which is, is deeply unconscious. And so it's right, you know, do, can we create a container where we can allow these things to rise to the surface in a way that doesn't completely overwhelm us? Right, exactly. Um, so, you know, as we look at all of these uh, wonderful insights, what practically could someone do right now who is, you know, sitting back and listening and saying, all right, I, I kind of get it and maybe I should do something. Mm -hmm. What would be that first step for someone who really isn't doing anything, uh, mm -hmm. you know, in regards to taking care of themselves? What would they really need to do right now that can propel them into being happy by living in wellness? Right. It's a great question. Uh, you know, I think that one of the first things that I ask people to do is to, you know, call a truce, just kind of be willing to call a truce on whatever the struggle is. They don't have to name it. They don't have to know what it is or what comes to it, but just have a willingness to try a new and novel approach you know, so it's like, it, it's just like, look at it as a game, as an experiment, as something that's light, that doesn't have a heaviness. You don't have to start creating a lot of big, hairy goals around it. Start making promises that you can't keep. It's, mm -hmm. you know, are you willing to simply try a new and novel approach? And, you know, most people are, yeah, we're, we're, are you on board with that? Yeah, I'm on board with that. Okay, first step, just simply begin to notice um, someone called it becoming a world-class noticer once, and I thought it was a fabulous way of putting it. If you just became a world-class noticer of your own behavior and, you know, without any kind of judgment around it. And, I, you know, you mentioned that earlier, how important that is. Just remain curious. If you were to kind of come back at this whole world of your eating behavior, maybe your dieting behavior, maybe the, the thoughts you have around behavior, you start to notice the excuses and the rationalizations you make. If you just you start with some willingness to try a new and novel approach, and then you begin to simply notice the behavior, notice your reactions. Don't make any attempts to change anything at this point. Just, mm -hmm. it's a gentle awareness. And as long as you remain curious, and you're not self-deprecating because, again, a lot of times we start to notice things. We say, oh, my God, are you an idiot or what? <laughs> and it, you know, it could just makes it kind of it's like we're feeding the frenzy that we're already, you know, that, that got us into the struggle in the first place. So, exactly. it's, you know, it's really just about starting to that journey of awareness. And, it, you know, I always say to people, the, the first step really is, is just a gentle awareness. When we have things arise into our awareness – we can actually then deal with them. You know, it's like Albert Einstein, I think, has said, uh, you know, you, can, you can't solve the problem on the same level of consciousness that created it. And that's really what we're doing here is, is when we actually 
start to bring, bring our behavior into our awareness and, in, and it's, we start to see things that we're doing that are automated and habitual and then maybe seeing that there was a specific situation that preceded a reaction, we can start then to deal with it differently. We unpack the problem yeah, so, and you, you know, come again, across I think that, you know, um, some this is something resources. that's entirely new. The first and really only thing that you need to bring is an attitude of willingness and that you really are coming forth with the, yeah, that opportunity to say, I'm, 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 I've tried everything else and at this point I really am willing to try something new and novel. And because the, uh, the approach is awareness, it's really just kind of bringing your own personal behavior up into the forefront so that you can kind of unpack the problem and look at it a little differently. Um, and so I typically refer to um, the first, you know, your first foray into awareness is to simply begin to notice your behavior. Um, mm -hmm. Somebody coined it as a becoming a world-class noticer, and I thought it was a brilliant way of putting it. It's really no more difficult than that. You simply start to observe your own behavior. Just as you're going throughout the day, you're starting to, uh, you know, just kind of create a little bit of space and time to do your own investigative work. And, and when you start to notice your own behavior, the second important thing is to really just remain curious and childlike and be non-judgmental. You know, that you're, that you're compassionate yep. and curious and that you don't begin self-deprecating. You know, that you don't notice a behavior, find it to be deplorable, and then start, uh, you know, ostracizing yourself because it is not going to help you and it's not going to move you forward. We're calling a truce on that kind of self-deprecating behavior. This is really about ending this struggle, accepting that it's an internal struggle that you need to own responsibility for, and that we're going to give you some tools to, um, once you've observed it, that you can actually work with it. So really the first and foremost is that, you know, you're starting down a road of awareness that your, your behavior is no longer just going to be unconscious and habitual, that you're actually going to create some space to observe what's going on. And with a few um, really simple tools of mind, mindfulness that you're actually going to be able to um, navigate that, you know, that space in between um, stimulus and response where you can actually respond differently. Rather than just reacting habitually, you're going to have an opportunity then to step in as the architect and respond in a way that is going to be more supportive of self-care. Because typically, I don't do a lot of goal setting with people. I like to say, let's make self-care the number one goal and the only goal. And really appreciate and understand what self-care means, what it is, what it isn't. And, and that food is the ultimate, feeding yourself well is the ultimate act of self-care. And so, you know, every time you're making a decision or a choice, that you're stepping back and saying, is this an, L, an, an, an act towards self-care? And there's going to be times where it may not feel like it, and you may not feel like you have control, and you may not feel like you're able to make that, that choice towards self-care. And that's, you know, that's, okay, that's got to be okay for now. We're, it, it's like taking baby steps. Um, a lot of these behaviors have been ingrained in us from the time we were children. So it, it's like anything. It, it takes time to unravel and to be patient and to work our way towards some new solutions. But, uh, you know, because we have to eat however many times a day we do, we have lots of opportunities to grow and change. So that's kind of a good thing. Uh, that's very much a good thing and the struggle yeah. because it, it's all there. Right. And, uh, but I, I really like how you're saying that, you know, to make that one goal, the self care. Mm -hmm. And I would totally agree that, you know, if that becomes the main goal and someone can follow that as best they can and taking care of self, right. uh, then, then most everything else is going to eventually fall into place. Well, and you know, Chris, it really does. I think that when you understand the nature of self-care and how it is something that, you know, I think when we, we're growing up, that is when self-care is really modeled to us and where 
the, the kind of the infrastructure, the bones of self-care are meant to be modeled to us. And I, I, unfortunately, the nature of our society over the last five generations have really steered away from that and been much more punitive where, right. you know, as opposed to modeling some really strong uh, structures of self esteem and self character and self responsibility, it's kind of like, do what I say. Um, uh, don't question anything. Doesn't really matter what interests you may have. This is what the success model is. And this is what you need to do to fit in. And no, uh, no need to start blaming your parents or, or starting any of that nature. That's just, again, that's sort of a, a self-deprecation in itself. It's, it, they didn't have the good model before them either. So right. it's kind of a situation that spiraled out of control. It's led to really the perpetuation of this Western diet as a self-medicating mm -hmm. um, animal that it is and you know the only way i think back to our true selves is through our really understanding our nature our, our nature and, and that self-care is a birthright you know and it and it really was meant to be that we just kind of got off track so it's really kind of about um, finding our way back home definitely definitely so if people want to learn more about you or get in touch with you, what would be the best way that someone could do that? Well, I have a website, I have a Facebook page, and I have been off the grid a little bit and I, I'm just uh, um, kind of coming back into the world from a, um, a global perspective. At my website is lauriecosser.com, so it's easy enough to find. There's a contact mm -hmm. page there. Um, that I'm very responsive to. I have a, my Facebook page I will give you the link to. And you, if you leave a comment, you can message me through the Facebook page. Again, I'm very, very responsive to that. And I really um, welcome the opportunity to kind of chew over and have conversations with people about a different approach to food, nutrition, and, um, uh, you know, that whole world and how it ties into our body image and, and, and what true health can really look like versus what we think it looks like. Right. And, and I definitely would encourage uh, all the listeners to check out what you offer and, and yeah, to get into that dialogue because it, it is so important in that self-care and in finding our own happiness. And, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not the expert on the nutrition. So when I talk about finding happiness is from a different, uh, you know, part of our overall wellness, but mm -hmm. in the belief of the holistic wellness, then mm -hmm. yes, I, I encourage people to, you know, seek you out and, and talk about the nutrition side of, of, you know, the holistic wellness and, mm -hmm it all goes hand in hand. It's not just one sided, but definitely goes hand in hand. So absolutely. Yeah. So I, I encourage people to uh, do that. And uh, I want to thank you, Laura. This has been a very enlightening conversation and, um, you know, really appreciate how you bring all of this together, uh, you know, into that notion of you are going to find your happiness, your peacefulness, in taking care of self. And so I, mm -hmm. I really appreciate your message and your time. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for having me on today, Chris. It's always a pleasure to talk about something I'm passionate about. And I look forward to any of your listeners that want to reach out a little bit more. Thank you for listening to this podcast episode. And I hope that the message in this episode has inspired you and given you some of the tools that you need to find peace in your life. If you have found those tools and you found this to be inspiring and you know of others who also need these tools, please share this podcast with them. Let them know of the opportunities out there that they too can find their inner peace. Thank you very much for the sharing. Thank you for listening. And have a very mindful day. Thank you for listening to this episode with Chris Shea. 
Learn more about Chris Shea by visiting his website, www.lifesjourneyblog.com.